Putting a Rolls Royce in a swimming pool was never going to be easy. Here's the story of how and why we did it. Be Here Now, 1997, and the artwork that we created for the sleeve. You've got to bear in mind that in 1997, when Oasis released Be Here Now, they were just massive. Probably the peak of the career in terms of record sales and just, you know, like Oasis mania breaking out around the band. I'm Brian Cannon, this is Microdot, Be Here Now. So the release date was obviously the 21st of August as is emblazoned upon the sleeve, which I believe was a first. So normally we would work six weeks back from that. But in this case, it was much sooner. We shot the sleeve on the 16th of April. Now the title, Be Here Now, I believe was a quote from John Lennon in some interview that he did. And there's also a George Harrison song of the same name. So clearly there's a Beatles reference there. And as with all Oasis artwork projects, the first stage was me meeting with Noel Gallagher to discuss what was going to happen. My starting point for this was be here now, i.e. the place. You've placed somewhere specific, be here now. So the first idea I had was each member of the band could choose anywhere they wanted to in the world to be photographed in. Because by this point, budgets were irrelevant. They were just the biggest thing in the world. You know, money was no object. So the four of them were to put, the four, minus Liam, the four of them were to choose locations throughout the world. And we would fly each one of them to that location and do basically a mini sleeve there and compose the four different places on the sleeve with Liam Gallagher floating in the middle over all of them. Be here now. And this was the first ever mock-up for that idea. Now when I first showed this to Noel, he was astonished that we'd gone this far. He just thought he was just going to see a sketch. Uh, but this is the actual one, the original one that I showed him back in 97. I've, I have shared this on social media in the past and people go, oh thank god they didn't do that. And that this was never going to be the actual sleeve. This was so you could get your head around the idea of how four different iconic locations would be merged together, you see. So the individual places that they all chose were Noel wanted to go to a place called the Devil's Tower in Wyoming. It's a flat top, big lump of rock that was famously in the film Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Here's a picture of that. Gwigsy wanted to be on a beach in the West Indies, watching cricket, can of red stripe, smoking a spliff, no doubt. I can't remember what Alan wanted to do, or even if he came back to us with a location, because obviously we didn't do it in the end. Bonehead wanted a Rolls Royce in a swimming pool with him sat next to it, uh, which was inspired by that. I think it's a myth, actually. I don't think it ever happened that uh, Keith Moon from The Who drove a Rolls Royce into a swimming pool. I think the, it was a, a Lincoln Continental, was it, perhaps? There was some car in some pool somewhere, something to do with Keith Moon. And as of that, this great rock and roll myth was born. And that obviously became the sleeve in the end, as we all know and love today. But... So we went from this kind of idea to this idea because nothing to do with budgets. We just didn't have the time. You can imagine how busy they were back then. We just didn't have the time to fly the four of them to different parts of the world, do each one as a shoot, come back and put it all together with Liam over the top. So we just settled for the one, which could be shot in England, obviously, because the rest were abroad. And that then became uh, the idea of the pool with the Rolls Royce based on, loosely on the, the rock and roll myth, which we, nobody knows if it's true or not actually, that Keith Moon drove a car in a pool. Um, so that's how we came up with the idea. As usual, we'll look at the sleeve credits. Now on this one, the sleeve credits were on the inside bags, the inner bags of the rec that held the records. Now I know that the reissues don't have inner bags, they just have plain white bags, but this is a 1997 original mint condition unplayed copy actually, which they used to scan to make the reissues. That's why there's a slight difference in quality to them and colour, I'll show you that later. But on this one, I actually worked with three different photographers, uh, and the credit goes, a Microdot sleeve, designed and directed by Brian Cannon. So what does that mean? Well, you know, designed by means I laid out all the text and put the logo in and what have you, but the directed bit means I directed the photography came up with the ideas and put the whole thing together, basically. Michael Spencer Jones, who shot the sleeve cover. Uh, Jill Fermanovsky, who did all the photography for the inner collage, which we'll get to later. And Barry Johnson, who actually isn't credited on the sleeve. He photographed the collage and the clock for the labels. Now, Barry also photographed um, the cover for the Nebworth brochure and all those summer 96 brochures, you know, the flags, he did all that. Uh, so three different photographers I worked with on this particular project. So we've got the concept, putting a Rolls Royce in a swimming pool. Not going to be an easy job, this. In fact, the most difficult sleeve that I've ever done. 
Um, and the most difficult part of the most difficult sleeve was finding somebody who had a swimming pool who would let us put a Rolls Royce in it. Uh, so for the first time ever, because normally me and Mike, the photographer, would go around scouting locations together. And this particular occasion, we hired the services of a location hunting service. So the actual location of the hotel, the Golf Hotel, uh, was Stocks House Hotel in Hertfordshire. And this was once owned by a guy called Victor Lowndes, who was Hugh Hefner's right-hand man in Europe in the Playboy organisation. So apparently there was loads of wild parties back in the 70s, which is kind of in keeping with the excess that this album was all about, really. And what I've got here is, there are two documents pertaining to this sleeve, both on micro-dot letter-headed paper from the time. Um, as I mentioned in a previous video, everything was always signed off, love and peace forever. I mean, this is to some guy I don't know in a... In a in a props higher place, it says love and peace forever, Brian Cannon on it. But anyway, uh, and what we've got here is, um, it's an agreement to, for all, because all, all the props were hired. We hired them all from props warehouse near the BBC in White City in West London. And what happened was, Liam and Noel and I went along there for the day, and they chose these props at random. And the idea was, we've got a Rolls Royce in a swimming pool, surrounded by all these bonkers objects that don't actually mean anything. And the reason why he did this was because I knew that by this point, they were so huge that everybody, the media, would dissect every single bit of this sleeve and trying to find the meaning in it. And that's precisely what happened. I'll get onto that later about how the tabloids really went to town in it and showed themselves up because it doesn't mean nothing. That's the whole point. It's, it's completely random. Joe's at random, doesn't symbolise anything. The only one bit of symbolism or relevance to anything, on the, obviously the date of the release, is the number plate on the Rolls Royce. We changed that. That is actually, what we changed it to, is the, is the number plate from the police van off the front cover of the Beatles Abbey Road album. Here's a pick. Notice, same number plate. But other than that, it doesn't mean anything. The whole point was to get everybody at it. So what we've got here is two documents. One, uh, which was the hire agreement and to hire all those props cost £3,000 plus VAT which I think is an awful lot of money considering there wasn't that much there really um, and this, this I find interesting we shot it on the 16th we collected everything on the 15th and had it back there for the 17th so that was really tight window and the other document I have here is the photo shoot budget so we'll go through the list of expenses here the location fee was 2350 including VAT, it says, and I think that was 17.5% then, so it was two grand. Now that two grand, I presume, was for the location hunting people and to pay the hotel for letting us do this. It says purchase of Rolls-Royce. Now, we didn't actually purchase it, we hired it from a scrapyard, because there's another point. Uh, let's get this myth out of the way right from the off. One, the Rolls-Royce really is in the pool, there's no doubt about that. But people presumed, or some people thought that we used like a, a roadworthy Rolls Royce. Well, Oasis were that wealthy at the time that we trashed a Rolls Royce. That's not the case. This Rolls Royce, there was no engine in it. It was scrap. Yeah, it wasn't a runner, basically. So we didn't trash a roadworthy Rolls Royce. We hired the Rolls Royce, not purchased it. Hired the Rolls Royce for £1,500. And if I'm not mistaken, see, I, I left at the end um, the following day before everything got taken away. Somebody had nicked the silver lady off the bonnet, you know, the, the Rolls Royce emblem. And I got a bill for something crazy, like five grand off the hire people, off the scrapyard to get the, the thing. I didn't pay it, obviously, and I don't know who took it. And to this day, still nobody knows. But yeah, somebody nicked the silver lady off the front. Shoot props, three grand. Yep. That's what we've said earlier here. We'll go through all the props shortly. And then there's, there's a few people on here, like Peter Muncy. Now, Peter Muncy, he was... Uh, a lot of these people worked in the film game because we'd done videos before for creation. Uh, not for Oasis, but for other bands. And these are a lot of characters who I've met whilst making videos. And, they, they, you know, they worked on feature films as well. So they were great to have on hand. Set builders, that kind of thing. Peter Muncy, his job was to construct the scaffolding stand beneath the Rolls Royce to hold the car up. Because we didn't just, he didn't just put it in the water. There is, like, you know, the sort of things you see on building sites that they hold ceilings up or before they put in RSJs and all the rest of it. There's a couple of them holding that car up with some old, it looks like tyres and beer crates. It's really ramshackle. I can't believe it didn't fall down. Uh, so Peter Munster was in charge of doing that, so that's why he's on here. A crane and operator hire, £858. The crane was obviously to position the car in the pool. 
transportation of cars to shoot them, about 500 quid. You know, this is 25 years ago. These are quite high prices, I think. It says tarp, tarpaulin, 30 pounds. And what that was, was on the poster here, you can see it's clear. Beneath the car, this is being held up by scaffolding, right? So to hide the fact that there's two big poles and tires and goodness knows what else propping that up, we wrapped a blue tarpaulin around it so it'd blend in with the water. And that's not actually Photoshop because obviously you've got the, the reflection of the car in it. That's what that was for. The tarp was to hide what the, was holding the car up. Lunch and dinner, £480. Everybody's got to be fed. Uh, this is an interesting one. Refill of pool, £255. Obviously to get the car into the pool, we had to drain it all. So you've got an empty pool with a car, a Rolls Royce being suspended above it. Noel Gallagher came up for the day to approve the position of the car. And we had it tilted at an angle before the scaffolding was put underneath it. And we put a piece of black gaffer tape along the side to intimate where the water line would be. Uh, so Noel oversaw that. And then we built a scaffolding beneath it. And then we refilled the pool. Now the refill of the pool took place overnight. And I remember, I rang John Platt the other day, John Platt from Microdot, who helped us do all this. And I said, what's your enduring memories of the shoot? And he said, me and you stood there the night before the shoot with the water filling the pool back up again. And we could hear the thing creaking. And I thought, it's going to go any minute, this. You didn't get too go. If that had fell off, that would have been the end of it. We'd have got kicked out and that, that would have been it. Uh, but it didn't. But what did happen was the filling of the pool consumed so much, because it's in a rural area, this. To fill that pool up so quickly, it basically took all the water from the local area. So nobody could flush the toilet overnight. And uh, <laughs> that's what happened. But to refill the pool, I don't understand why. I mean, it's just turning the tap on, you would have thought. But we got charged 255 quid for that. Um, turf, here's another one. £50 fee for turf, because to position that card into that pool, is a huge crane which basically gouged out the turf over there. So we had to re-turf certain areas and we had to repaint the pool, £200 for that. So that was all the expenses on the day, uh, or, or most of them. So now we're going to look at the props themselves. As I mentioned earlier, uh, me, Liam and Noel went along to this place in West London and it was called Studio and TV Hire um, in White City, West London. And that's where we got all these objects from. Not all the props that we hired made it to the final shoot. Uh, one famously that went was a traffic light, you know, uh, it just looked too big and too cumbersome, you know, huge traffic light stood there. But the, the one that I find most interesting is, uh, and I've got a proof of this, is the phone box. Have you ever wondered why on the Be Here Now tour, they come out of the, because the stage set for the Be Here Now tour was all objects from the album. You know, you've got the Rolls Royce, you've got the clock, all that. Why is there a phone box? There's no phone box on there. Because when we shot this, there was a phone box. There was a phone box top, it was a telephone on it, floating in the pool. And there's a proof of this, which you can see on our Instagram page. I'll, there's a link in the description below, and our Instagram handle is on screen right now. Uh, so go there to have a look at this, and follow us up on there, because there's loads of interesting stuff all the time on that. But the, we took it out, digitally removed it, because it was just, there was a big block of red, if you can imagine that. There's a big block of red just there, and it just detracted too much from the car. So the phone box wound up on the stage set because the set designers saw that proof that we had at Microdot, the one that's now on the Instagram page, and it had the phone box in, still in the water. So that's why they went away and designed everything around, presuming that that would still be in it when it came time for the sleeve. They didn't know that we took it out. So the stage set was done independently of the sleeve, obviously. They'd just seen all the elements, but by the time they'd done it, we took the, took the phone box out. So the other props, the clock, the clock actually did have hands on it. They are digitally removed. And I only noticed the other day, actually, that the reissues on the labels of the record, which is the clock face, obviously, it still has the hands on it, yet the original, i.e. this version, doesn't have the hands on it. The calendar, on the day of the shoot, because we didn't know for certain what the release date was going to be, because that's clearly the release date, August the 21st. It said, I think it was the 3rd of September, because we weren't sure, because it was that far ahead of when it was coming out, we didn't have the exact correct date on it. As I mentioned, the, the Rolls Royce number plate was changed. The big sort of 60s television screen there, I don't know if you've noticed this, on the television screen is the album sleeve that we superimposed on it. That's a nod to my favourite sleeve of all time, 
Umagumma by Pink Floyd. The same image is repeated in the picture on the wall over and over and over. Here's what that looks like. So that's a nod to that. You've got no looking at the globe. There's a kind of a nod uh, back to definitely maybe with a globe hanging from the ceiling. Bonehead with the key. Uh, the record player playing at Liam and Liam's scooter. Now Liam did own that scooter and we had it round here the other week and I'll show you some footage of it now. Um, so here it is, the original, this is not a replica, this is the original, the same one that was on the sleeve, brought to us by its current owner, Tim. That scooter was registered as Liam's two days before the shoot. If you look at the, he's obviously got the logbook, the current owner, so if you look at the, the, how it's changed hands over the years, it was registered to Liam Gallagher's name two days before the shoot, so that was Liam's scooter on the day of the shoot. He's obviously subsequently sold it, and uh, here it is in the boutique now. So now we'll talk about the photoshopped elements of the sleeve. We've established that the car wasn't photoshopped. <laughs> the, the thing that you think was most obviously photoshopped isn't, and other bits actually are. Now I was speaking to Martin Catherall the other day. Martin did all the digital work on this, and he was telling me that it just took forever. Not because it was that difficult a job. You could probably do it on your iPhone nowadays, he said. But back then, the technology, the Photoshop technology was nothing like it, nothing like it is today. There's no, there was no layers, or maybe you could just have one or two layers. So you had to do tons of different versions. So the Photoshop elements of it are, the hands come off the clock. There are actually hands on that clock, or they were on the shoot date. Obviously, the date on the calendar had to be changed because that wasn't correct to the, the release date on the day of the shoot. On this particular shot, because there's obviously one master shot here that then we amended. The mainstay of the shot is as you see there, but Gwigsy was actually stood behind that sign that says silence, out of the pool, and he's photoshopped in climbing out of the pool. The proof with the phone box in it has all of this prior to Photoshop. So Gwigsy stood over there. Like I said, you can see it on our Instagram page. But the, I don't know why I had him do this. This tree here, I just thought, oh, I don't like the look of it. So I had Martin just fettling with that for goodness knows how long, just to take bits of that tree out, and that's what took the most time. The proof before we did all the, the Photoshop work is dated, and you can see in the corner of it, the 1st of May. So all this work would have been done in May after we've seen the, the initial scan proof back. And one other important point, this was shot on 35mm film. The fact it's shot on film means that you don't know what you're getting on the day. So we had to completely overcompensate. You couldn't get this wrong. We must have shot a th over a thousand frames, but it was shot on 35 mil frames. So what that means is the shape of the image is like rectangular. Record sleeves are obviously square. So again, if you see that proof on our Instagram page, it shows you in its original form, the 35 mil frame in full, which was stretched to, to all fit in to a square. So that's why everything's slightly elongated. So the shoot itself, the most difficult shoot we've ever had to do. Sticking a Rolls Royce in a swimming pool, not easy. We didn't have that much time to do it either. We, we only, the car and everything arrived the day before the actual shoot. You know, you think you'd have weeks to set it up. No, we didn't. We had to get in there, get it done and get out. But I remember Bonehead turned up and he was driving at that time, which was probably my favourite car in the world, an Aston Martin DB7. He knew that I loved that car and he threw me the keys in the car park outside the hotel and said, yeah, take it for a spin cannon. And I said, but I'm not insured to drive it. And his response was, if you crash it, I'll get another. So I went off driving around Hertfordshire in Bonehead's DB7. Must admit, I never got it out of second gear. I was doing about 25 mile an hour and I was terrified. Uh, Gwigsy at the time had probably the world's best concourse condition E-type Jag. He still had like the, the touch-up paint that came with it unopened a lot. So he turned up in a, a gold E-type Jag. Liam and Noel can't drive, obviously. And if I remember rightly, did Whitey have a Mini? I think he might have showed up in a Mini. Um, so that was that. And, you know, it was a beautiful sunny day. Again, the, the, you know, like the roll with it one. We, had it been lashing down with rain, God knows what we would have done. Because if you think about it, the cars, everything's there. You couldn't do that again. What happened was, on the day of the shoot, unbeknown to... Because the hotel was still open. We couldn't close the hotel. So there were still guests coming and going. And one guy, who was posing as a golf tourist, whatever you call it, was taking pictures of the scene. It transpired that he worked for one of the tabloids. Somebody must have tipped him off at the hotel. And the day after the shoot, this scene, before we'd even developed our film, was a double page spread in one of the tabloids. 
And lo and behold, like I mentioned earlier, they try to explain what everything means. Oh, this refers to that, and that means that. And whilst I was horrified, I was laughing my head off in equal measure because they got it completely wrong. Creation Records actually ended up in a battle with the paper because the paper wanted to, I think they either give away as a poster or selling the poster of the image. And Creation lost the court case because the judge argued, or the judge reasoned that just putting a load of random objects together doesn't constitute that you own the copyright. Um, so the fact that one of their photographers took a picture, that was deemed okay, and they got away with it, and off it went. Um, but yeah, the first time I saw a, pic a print of this was in the newspaper at breakfast the following morning. So that's the front image done. We've done all the digital work. We've got it all sussed out. So then it, how it applies to other parts of the release, starting with the back sleeve here, the hourglass. Alan White is actually sat on it on the front cover. The, uh, many people won't have noticed that. I'll zoom into that now. This red, this thing here, is a detail from the side of the scooter. And I will be doing a limited edition print of the scooter itself. The dice. This found its way onto a t-shirt back in the day. That dice is the cap for the inner tube inflator on the scooter. So see that there? That, you know, the, you basically unscrew that and to pump the tyre up, the air valve will go onto that. The inside, now this does not appear on the reissued version. And this is a collage that I did. This is made up of photographs taken by Jill Fermanovsky and she gave me all a huge bag full of all photographic prints and Polaroids. That's a real favorite bit of mine. Uh, and I spent weeks doing this. That's a real pound note that's in there. And that was my Union Jack Swirl cassette, which I subsequently, well, I'd lost the cassette by that point anyway. I just, I just had the actual box itself and the inlay. This string of shots here, I took at the Cork gig, the Park of Champions gig in Cork, from where I was stood on the lighting tower and did a panoramic view and stuck them all together. But yeah, that's how the inner of the original version was done. The original from 97 differs to the remastered, reissued version insofar as there are no printed inner bags on the new one. These are what came with the original. And again, it's all details from bits and ears. So this shot here is the actual record needle, the needle that you would play the record with, off of the record player there. Uh, on the other side, and you can see it's close up there with no putting a record on. On the other side of it, the abacus, which is behind Alan. Um, some close-ups of the scooter speedometer with the mileage on it. And funnily enough, when it came to the studio the other day, the actual original scooter, the mileage, it changed by how much, Lee? Three. Three miles. Yeah. It had done three miles since then. And I doubt that they had been done actually under its own power. That's probably just been it being pushed around, you'd have thought. Uh, so yeah, it's done three miles in 25 years. Rare stuff. Time for some rare stuff. You want to see some rare stuff? Here we go. The chrome will improve. The, you know, I, I always talk about these, the match prints, the pre-pressed match prints. There's only ever two of these made for every release. They were very expensive and there's just no need to make any more than two. Uh, I think, I say two, there, there might only be one of these. I'm not sure. I've certainly only got one. This is what was made before we actually printed them to make sure everything was looking all right. Um, front and back together on the vinyl version there. This is a 1997 Creation Records original Street Fly poster. That is for sale. That is currently on the Microdot website. Uh, we've got this here, which is an annotated illustration that I did of the artwork. Uh, limited edition of 100. Some of those left currently on the website. This I think is interesting. The fan club only box set. The, this came in both CD and vinyl version. But what I find most interesting, this is the CD version. What I find most interesting about this is, within this box set here, is this book, which I designed, uh, all with Jill's photography about the making of the record. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, that only came with this box set. So that's a lovely piece, that. This is a 2022 25th anniversary silver vinyl version. Uh, the sleeves themselves are the same as the 2014 remastered. I don't know if you can see, can you tell the difference from that in terms of scan? One thing you might have noticed, the originals have got a white border on. I put a black border on the reissues so you could tell at a glance it was a reissue. Uh, another interesting be here now piece, now this definitely is not for sale. 
uh, is my presentation disc awarded to me by Oasis for doing the artwork obviously but this marked six times platinum of the record and uh, look at that how's that so that's it how we did the artwork for Oasis be here now we really put that Rolls Royce in that pool whilst it was tricky we had a right laugh doing it so again thanks for watching it means the absolute world to us see you in the next one